Wow, thank you so much. Thank you for this incredible honor, uh, the award, and the incredible honor to be the commencement speaker tonight. I want to first thank uh, President Doty for uh, inviting me and Dean Gilliard and Chancellor Strupa, who could not be here tonight, for inviting me to this wonderful occasion and giving me the honor to provide your commencement speech. It is truly an honor. But when they invited me, it looks like they forgot to tell me this is going to be a slumber party. I'm just glad they thought it through and had a robe for me too. So. It's risky business trying comedy. <laughs> you and your families should be very proud of your accomplishments in completing this critical milestone. You have succeeded in a very challenging academic environment. You've been mentored by some of the most gifted professors and thought leaders, like Professor Adibi, Razanetti, and Smith. You have developed professional skills that will last a lifetime, and more importantly, have learned how to learn, and the next phase in your professional lives will be equally, if not more challenging, and it's good that you've learned how to learn, because exciting times lay ahead. So, with your slumber party robes on, I have a bedtime story for you. As Professor and Dean Gilliard mentioned, I came to this country with my family at age of nine. And I began working at Unisys as a co-op engineer at age 18. I started Massimo in the garage in 1989 at the age of 23, 24, in Mission Viejo, not too far from here, and it really did have an attached garage. I did it with a $40,000 loan I took on my condo. Over time, we raised nearly $100 million from venture capitalists, and today we are a public company with approximately 3,000 employees and $500 million in revenue. So if you're still awake, let me go a little deeper. When my bachelor's and master's from San Diego State University in the works, I knew I couldn't stay in a big company for the rest of my life. So I left Unisys in San Diego to take a job as a field applications engineer at Bell Industries here in Orange County. While presenting what we could do technologically to a potential customer, a startup company called Newport Medical a series of events happened that shaped my life to today. The people at Newport, seemingly impressed with my talk, asked me to take over their research and development of a low-cost pulse oximeter they were trying to develop. Having been fascinated with pulse oximetry, which I'd seen before, I accepted. For those who don't know what pulse oximetry is, you have a sensor, like a flashlight, that you shine on your finger, like we did when we were children. But the light that comes through, you can actually, with it, measure how much oxygen is in the blood. So soon after I began, I noticed the problem of motion artifact. I thought I could solve the problem with adaptive filters, which was something I learned during my master's program at San Diego State University. But they were not interested. They wanted me to make the low-cost pulse oximeter. But I was just about to learn the best lesson in life, my lesson in business ethics, which is how we spend most of our wakeful hours. Which, so it's very good to have good business ethics. Newport Medical had a buyer. They were going to take me and make me the president if I just went along with it all. But I learned that they had represented the product we, that we were working on as a finished product and that we had customers to ship it to. I had to think hard about what I was going to do. Why? Because here I was, a 23-year-old, and I hadn't yet decided if my personal integrity and ethics should be a corporation's integrity and ethics. In hindsight, it was not a tough decision but this was the late 80s, and corporate titans and deal makers were the news, and they even made movies about it, and integrity was never in the headlines. I made the decision. 
I made the decision that a company's principles had to be the highest principles of the people who ran the company. And therefore, I wrote a letter to the chairman of the board, and I informed them of truly where we were in the development of the product. Well, the shit hit the fan. It is now after 8 p.m., and parental guidance is suggested. So to make a long side story short, I left them and started Massimo. One of the first things I toiled over is to figure out what were my own personal guiding principles. And once I figured them out, I made it Massimo's guiding principles. And they were to remain faithful to the promises and responsibilities I had, to be driven by fascination and accomplishment, not by power and greed, to make every day as fun as possible. I hope there's something else after this out there, but even if there is, every day is an important day and we need to make it as fun as possible. So I urge you not to watch too much TV. So another guiding principle was to improve every year, make every year better than the year before by individually improving. And last but not least, something I added years later, to do what is best for patient care. So these became Massimo's guiding principles. And Massimo was born, and the goal was to figure out how to make pulse oximeters work during motion artifact, which had made pulse oximeters unreliable and had been the bane of monitoring. I had a hunch that adaptive filters could work. So I started off with our mission statement, and given my recent experience, it was not very sophisticated. It was Massimo because nobody likes an asshole. Parents, ladies and gentlemen, I promise the language will not get worse. Second and final mission statement, which is still with us today, is to make, to improve patient outcome and reduce cost of care by taking non-invasive monitoring to new sites and applications. And we invented the technology, signal extraction technology, we call it. But as you've heard before, inventions are 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. We literally worked seven days a week for seven years. And I remember taking two four-day weekends off during that seven-year period. We took a lot of risks. We left our jobs lived on fumes at times, and did my best to avoid the venture capitalists controlling our company. And there's a reason why. It's a side joke, and I'll try to say it properly. The joke goes like this. A venture capitalist decides to take a vacation and flies to New Zealand, where there's a lot of sheep. While he was resting under a tree, he couldn't help himself. He sees a shepherd walking the sheep, and when the shepherd comes by, he introduces himself and says, I bet I can figure out how many sheep you have. And the shepherd looked at him and said, wow, that's quite amazing. OK. He said, well, if I do, I want one of your sheep. And the shepherd said, OK. We'll see if he can do it. So he looks, and he says, 153 sheep. And the shepherd says, wow, that is impressive. Yes, that's what I have. Go pick yourself out a sheep. So on the way back, after the venture capitalist had picked the sheep and brought it over, the shepherd said, will you give me a chance to win my sheep back? And the venture capitalist said, well, that sounds fair. He says, how do you propose to do that? He said, well, I think I can guess what you do for a living. And he said, OK, that would be remarkable. We're on. So he said, well, you clearly are very analytical because you could quickly decide how many sheep I had. But you also clearly don't understand my business because the sheep that you're holding is actually my dog. <laughs> so to save the venture capitalists from themselves, I advise you, if you, do, or if you are lucky enough to raise money for them, don't let them lead you astray. 
We also try to work with the industry. There was an 800 pound gorilla who was the market leader, had about 80, 90% market share, but could not solve this problem of motion artifact with pulse oximetry. So they were very interested in working with us. We almost did a deal with them. Unfortunately, the deal fell apart. And soon after, when they ran into me at a trade show, they said to me that we are going to crush you like a bug. Not very nice. Most and Castle's walls went up. They decided to infringe our patents. We sued them. So what did they do? Not only they sued us back with 10 patents, they bought Newport Medical, who had been defunct for over 10 years, and said they owned all of my patents because I came up with the ideas while I was at Newport Medical. At this point, it sounds like a scary story, but hang on, it does get better. The world, well, most of the world wants you to succeed, but not everybody, <laughs> especially those who feel that you're interfering with their plans for success. And some think success is a win-lose, but success not only happens best when it's a win-win, but long-term, it's the only way to win. And we won. The technology really worked. We were fortunate enough that the New York Times did an expose of how these mega companies with the help of third parties were erecting barriers for innovative technologies to get to the market. As a result, there were Senate hearings held. I was asked to testify. We were able to finally sell our products in the US hospitals. After a seven year patent litigation, we won one of the biggest lawsuits in the medical technology industry. We enjoined them about, we collected to date about $600 million and we won the antitrust suit, which is very hard to do. And we're now one of the fastest growing patient monitoring companies. One of the most, if not the most successful medical tech IPOs, if not an OC IPOs of the decade. More importantly, patients benefited. We saved lives, we saved eyesight of babies, and hospitals benefited. Investors benefited. Our early investors got well over 100 times their money back. The last investor in got 10 times their money back. And maybe more important to me, hundreds of people at our company became millionaires. Just today, before I came, I was talking to one of the people who who has diligently worked for us in the production floor and told me the small stock options we gave him allowed his family to buy a home. And these are the wonderful things you get to do when you set on a journey like this and you're lucky enough to fulfill the journey. And yes, we also, I almost forgot, we won a lot of awards. Thank you, it's, it's wonderful. And thank you for tonight's award. Thank you. We did not rest, and we continue to innovate. So I guess this is the part where I attempt to summarize what I've learned from my experience that you as graduates can take with you for succeeding in the world of business. Well, first of all, find what you love to do and do a lot of it. I, I stumbled on my high school, I guess senior year yearbook, and I can't believe I wrote that under my statement. And I don't know where I got it from, but it says the only time success comes before work is in the dictionary. And it is true. Your business ethics should be the organization's business ethics. Keep it simple. People want to complicate things, but you have to just make good products and give better service to customers than they expected. It really is that simple. If you've got a chance to hire people, hire people that are better than you. I was gifted to have amazing people that I brought around me, and each one of them were better than me in the area that they were pursuing in our company. Create simple and strong guiding principles. During those what may look like tough decisions, you go back to them, and they make the decisions seem simple. Look for business models that can grow with you. Make sure you have lasting differentiators. 
and protect your intellectual property. Engage in our democracy. Visit your lawmakers. Voice your opinions and support the one that you believe in. Be persistent. If you have a good business model and what you plan to do will improve society, don't give up. You will make it. I guess I have also a don't. If you have to start a company and you want to contact the market leader, don't. Contact the second, third, fourth company, not the market leader. If you are still awake, I will now close with some thoughts. Thank you. Success should be defined in terms of happiness, not how much money you have, not the toys you have. Happiness comes from living within your means, choosing a productive life, and living that life with integrity and outward kindness. No matter what you have to do, do it with a smile and give it your all. One of my favorite movies and favorite lines from a movie is a Braveheart line. All men must die, but some men live. We have one shot in life. Please take it. Further human condition and the human aspiration. And finally, I'd like to close off by wishing you all peace and hope that one day we can have a world without aggression and fear, but with only peace and courage, and that we can all have the ability to pursue our happiness and dreams. Congratulations, class of 2013. Thank you.